and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, the man behind the sagas system, or setting and genre agnostic system. Which is a, which is a bit redundant for me to say, for me to add that, but old habits. It's all right. I he's, made the same mistake just the other day. <laughs> he's not the best DM. He's not the worst DM. He is the okayest DM. But some of you may know him as a menace, known as Dennis. That being Dennis Fleming. How That's you doing me. today, man? I am happy and healthy. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah. Th thank you for coming on. And um, put, and putting up with all my bad jokes, I'm pretty. Sh I'd be disappointed if somebody hadn't done the Dennis the Menace joke at least once to you. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm very familiar. <laughs> oh. oh, so I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So there are really two different stories that I tell uh, when I consider my first actual introduction to tabletop role-playing games. Um, one is comes when I was in, I think I had just graduated from high school. Um, and I don't remember the context, but I came across a uh, fourth edition book. And I started reading through it, and I was like, this stuff looks really, really cool. And as I continued reading through it, I realized this was a game. And I'm like, wait, you can just play in this world? So it was that, uh, I think it was the 4th edition Player's Handbook or Monster Manual or something. And I slowly, like the light bulb slowly turned on. I'm like, wait, this is amazing. You can actually just tell your own stories with a group of people around a table. And you don't have to, like rely on someone else to tell the stories like a book movie or video game yes please um so immediately i started trying to find someone to run this for me obviously starting with like my parents and people i knew and i spent a month or so trying to figure out who was going to show me this game and how to play it and i could not find anyone given i didn't look that hard um so i decided you know what i'll just run it myself so uh, a year or so later, I finally got a couple friends together, and uh, by that time, 5th edition had come out. So I bought those books and uh, started to, you know, from scratch, learn how to play this game, and I ran that first session myself. It was an absolute shit show. It was so bad, but we had a blast playing it and trying to figure out what was going on, figure out the rules. Um, I look back and realize, wow, nobody can start out playing as a GM and do a good job. Um, so it was very much trial by fire for me, uh, starting out as a GM. And pretty much since then, uh, I've been the forever GM because nobody else wanted to take on that mantle that I, I, I was already carrying. I have played a couple games, like probably several games by now since then, obviously. Um, but that was my first real like dive headfirst into the TTRPG universe. But it wasn't actually my first exposure to it. Uh, a couple years ago, I recalled that there was actually an earlier time where my dad tried to introduce me to... Uh, Dungeons and Dragons like he had played in high school and I, w I think I was middle school at the time um, and he took me to a local game store and it was an adventuring league night so we came to I think it was fourth edition we came to the place with our characters all built and everything um and I sat down on the table, super excited to figure out what the heck this the whole thing was all about. Like, these are all nerds like me. They like the same stuff I do, as far as I can tell. Uh, I was one of the youngest people there, but it was I was still very excited. Um, and the... 
the first thing that happens in the session is we walk down, I think it was like a stone hallway or a forest or something, and the big bad of the entire multi-session campaign shows up for two rounds of combat. Mm -hmm. um, I, being the rogue, do what I think the rogue is supposed to do. You run up and stab them, right? Uh, so I did that. Obviously, I missed and the dungeon master was like, well, uh, she's going to take a swipe at the, you then. And he didn't roll behind a screen and roll a natural 20. I was like, oh, that's a big number. That can't be good. Um, and he said, well, yeah, that's a critical hit. Um, she deals uh, 42 points of damage to you. And I'm like, oh, uh, I only have 30-something hit points. What does that mean? Oh, it means you're dying now. Okay. I failed my first three death saves in the next subsequent rounds and was dead. I just sat at the table for the rest of the session. And I was like, this game sucks. This is the worst thing ever. And it is not surprising in hindsight why it took me another five to six years to rediscover it and realize, wait, this is more than just dying and sitting around a table twiddling your thumbs. So that's that was my introduction to tabletop role playing games. Yeah. So now with that with that in mind, uh, obviously the next step to go into is how is how sagas came to be, because it's never it's never just a a light bulb moment of oh I, oh I want to make my own because you're going from from D and from D and D likes to a more universalist approach, and I'm curious how that transition ended up happening. Um, well, sagas, like many of the new games popping up lately, is a result of what I've heard called the OGL boom. So I don't know if you heard, but uh, in January of this year, oh, there was I'm, a I'm, mini apocalypse that happened. <laughs> I am I am very familiar with that. I was at ground zero for that whole damn thing. Um, oh man! And I had I had I had said at the time that um this may and this may end up being a blessing in disguise because because a lot of people would look at this and go, why why should why should I be doing why should why should I trust you when you could, when you could just as easily fuck me over the way you did the way you did with this little stunt? Um, yeah, and, and that's, a lot of, that's exactly the mindset I had as well. Yeah, a and lot of it people. Is why I I decided doing my own stuff. Yeah, a lot of people decided to go. Well, screw screw you. I'll make my own RPG with blackjack and hookers. Okay, maybe not the hookers. <laughs> but yes, that is exactly what happened. Um, with the creation of sagas, I started thinking, well, I kind of always wanted to do something that wasn't fantasy, and uh, but I don't want to learn a new system. So before I even knew that there were other universal uh, RPGs out there, I started thinking, well, I also really, really like D12s, and you don't get a lot of those in Dungeons & Dragons. So what if I make that the main die of a new system. And that was just where my train of thought happened. Like the idea of creating a system was hidden within this um, line of thought of, I don't want to play D and D anymore. And once I realized it was there and I realized I had been like designing new mechanics in my head while I sat at my desk at work, um, I realized, okay, this is actually what I'm doing. Um, and obviously went through many, many phases in those next couple days of like, okay, I, I want to design a game, but what is it going to look like? Originally, the first name it had was uh, D13. And the I, it took me a, a whole 24 hours to realize how stupid it was. But the idea was it, it would be not D12. That can't be what the name of the system is. We'll call it D13. Um, why is it D13? Maybe everything starts with a uh, roll of a D12 plus one. And then there's other stuff to ha that happens from that. And I quickly realized, no, that would be a nightmare. What is this plus one for? And I scrapped that idea, but I, and I leaned towards a more, um, 
mathless system. In fact, that was almost the name for a bit. We were going to call it mathless, the TTRPG. And then I realized, well, that would be very difficult to do it with if you have dice, there's going to be uh, math by most definitions of what math is. So um, by this time, I had a whole bunch of uh, alpha testers with me that were on board with this idea of like creating a very simple and straightforward game that can be used to play in any setting. Um, and we started throwing ideas out and we like we uh, started saying, okay, what if it was an acronym? Uh, that would be really, really easy to trademark. Um, so we started throwing out acronyms and the one we landed on was Sagas, Setting and Genre Agnostic System. And since then we've tried to do our best to stick to that title. Um, we uh, have challenged many to try to think of a setting or genre that can't be run using this rule system, and we have yet to find one that doesn't work with it. Uh, we've done Pokemon, we've talked about doing a survivor game, uh, we've done a couple different anime, we've done all sorts of different uh, American IPs, We've done pretty much every genre that there already is a TTRPG for, you know, uh, cosmic horror, folk horror, uh, high fantasy, sword and sorcery, um, sci-fi, uh, space opera. We've done all of these and they all have worked very and surprisingly well, which I'm very happy about. Um, mm -hmm. But the beginning was, yes, this is another one another game that jumped out of the OGL boom and uh so it is I recognize that it is it is one of many that is being developed right now and only time will tell which one of which of these games that is under development will stand the test of time I hope Sagas ends up being one of them I'm definitely putting the work into it um one of the ways that I hope it will remain a staple at least uh among my uh ttrpg circles is it's free and it is going to be free forever in its final iteration is going to be pay what you want you could go on drive through rpg right now and get the current playtest version 0 0.7 and just download it at mm -hmm. no cost um and that's definitely i want to i want to keep this srd at as little of an entry threshold as possible to make it as accessible as I can. That is, un that is understandable. Now, when it comes to the core mechanic that you, that you're doing of, um, a, a, a straight up difficulty that is rolled with usually one dice. Um, how did you, how did you come to that particular approach given that like, Again, you're doing you're doing a jump from a d20 based system to a to a multi, to a multi he, multihedral, I guess is the word I'm going to use. Even if that's not a word, I will make it one. <laughs> it, we'll say it is. <laughs> but how how did you how did you come to the conclusion of doing that? I'm guessing there were a few um, resolution systems that ended up on the cutting room floor. Yes, there were quite a few. Um... I won't go through exactly what systems were scrapped, um, but I mentioned earlier that during the development, we wanted to make this as easy as possible. And one of the ways we wanted to do that was by getting rid of the math uh, and making it a mathless system. Um, and like I said earlier, that's pretty much impossible. We found that out uh, as we were going through different uh, strategies, um, but we tried to figure out how we could do it at least without modifiers to your role. So, you know, in D&D, &D, you roll a D20 and then you add something to it. Uh, we wanted to take that add something to it away. Uh, so we tried to figure out what other ways we could um, make people better or worse, um, give people better or worse roles depending on whether their characters are better or worse at whatever activity it is, right? Um, so there were two other... Uh, ways we could do this. The first one was changing the difficulty. That's obvious. Changing the target role that, uh, the target number that you need. 
the second was by changing the size of the die you're using. Um, by reducing the number of sides, not only do you make lower numbers more likely to be rolled, but you take away even the possibility of rolling those higher numbers. Um, we, I actually reached out to my cousin who has a PhD in mathematics from Berkeley uh, to help me with creating this, you know, figuring out what the probability of rolls is going to be, is going to look like for this when you roll, um, when you roll different size of, sizes of die. And we realized, you know, there's not really, this isn't enough options. Even if we keep a D20 and a D4 in there, uh, which uh, is really, really uh, extreme. Like you go for the difference between a D20 rolling a nat and that one, which is a critical and exactly what you want to in this system because uh, rolling low is good is what we decided. Um, but you could roll a natural one on a D20, that's a 5% chance, right? But on a D12, that is almost double the chance um, and the same thing with the difference between a uh, D6 and a D4. It's not quite double in either case, but it is much more extreme, the difference between those dice as it is between, you know, a D10 and a D12 or a D8 and a D6. So we took away the 20 and we took away the 4 and realized with 4 options there's not enough. So another thing we added, which is something we took straight out of D&D, is when you roll damage, sometimes you get to roll multiple dice. So we um, started having you roll, we tried rolling multiple dice and taking the lower one, like advantage. Um, sorry, not damage. This 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 is inspiration uh, from D&D's advantage system, where you roll two and you take the higher one. Mm -hmm. um, and with that, we opened up a lot more and a lot more complicated uh, probability chart for uh, how you are going to roll underneath the score that you need. Um, and that is essentially how the current mechanic came to be. The GM sets a difficulty first, then the player determines by looking at their character sheet which dice to roll and then they determine by working with the other people around the table how many they get to roll. Um, so you can roll three dice. You'll always take the lowest one because that's what you're trying to get. Yeah, and I, I can cer I can certainly go with that. And what's I suppose I suppose what hel what helps is that even with the varying dice, um, you do have you do have a roam in the form of the d10. Or if so, or if somebody's really unfortunate, D twelve. Right. So we needed we needed a base uh, for something to start as, and um, we decided on D ten because our four dice that we had are six, eight, and twelve. Mm -hmm. um, but twelve is you, we needed something to be there as like a hindrance for when you're bad at something, but it's not impossible. So we obviously reserve the highest die for that. And we decided on D10 because that allows um, two different levels of you know leveling up to improve your own personal abilities where you can roll a D8. And then once you're at higher levels, even higher levels, you can roll a D6 um, and get even closer to rolling underneath whatever the difficulty is for that. Now, with the, with that in mind, um, the other the other thing to the other thing to cover is the effort system, which falls into the 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 nickname I give extra they give um extra effort systems, which is what which is well extra effort. Um, that's my shorthand for a Yay. lot of a lot of those <laughs> me, a lot of meta currencies that you see in di that you see in different games, whether it be Willpower in World of Darkness, Edge in Shadowrun, Moxie in Eclipse Phase. Oh, there's you. There's usually some sort of limited use resource that can um that can either boost die or act as an edit button or sometimes both. And mm -hmm. that's what I saw when it came to um effort, but was. 
Was effort that was effort something that came around around the same time as the die system, or was it something that was suggested later on? That came around um, around the same time as the die system. Uh, like we definitely needed a way for people to roll those extra dice, and at first it was just a placeholder. Like, what if you spend these unnamed points to give yourself extra stuff, and we'll talk about how the points work and how what else you spend them on and how you get them back later. But we needed a placeholder for something to allow players to roll extra dice because that was going to be a main mechanic of our, a main part of our main mechanic. Um, so it was developed pretty much uh, immediately after we settled on the uh, four, uh, the multihedral main mechanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And when it comes to character creation, the the one thing that um, was a bit surprising for me was having a universeless game that operates on a level system. Um, the majority of universeless games are going to operate on a point based affair, which neither one is better or worse than the other, but each of the, but both of them have their um, caveats. What made you stick with a what made what made you stick with a level um, approach? Originally, it was because it was the only thing I was really familiar with. You know, pretty much every single TTRPG I've played, with the exception of Easy D6, has been a level up system. Um, I honestly didn't know that there were other systems out there when I started making this. Um, and even right now, I'm still comfortable knowing those systems are out there and having looked at a couple, I'm still very comfortable sticking with our level up system because it's what I understand. And, uh, I feel like that's the same with many other players out there with, uh, because D and D has its level up system and it is, I think by far the most popular tabletop role playing game. So I wanted, like, it went into this sort of, um, I want it to be familiar and accessible. Um, so a level up system is not going to be a new thing to most people coming into this. Mm -hmm. And to that, to that, to that particular end, there's the whole, there's a whole thing with, um, the idea, the idea of traits and struggles, as well as ta as well as talents, isn't too, isn't too surpri isn't too surprising. But what I find interesting is the fact that it isn't a positive and negative um, approach, which is what happens often, and that's how you that's one of the big ways that you get um, min maxing, a, a term I'm pretty sure you're familiar with. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, we wanted to. In trying to take out the math, we, it wasn't, it was really an accident. We took out um, most of the ability to min-max, um, but there were definitely some people in alpha testing that uh, tried their damnedest to uh, munchkin their characters and make them as powerful as they can. Like, technically, these do work together in stacks, so this, this works. Um, and I'm saying, okay, yeah, rules is written, I'll allow it. And so we definitely kept those in as well. So you can min-max within sagas. It's just a, I guess it's a different kind of min-maxing because I certainly have done that playstyle, you know, where you just make as powerful as a character as you can. And that's a ton of fun. Making a powerful character, watching them succeed in combat, doing exactly what they're designed to do, uh, is it feels rewarding. It's cathartic. Um, so we didn't want to remove that ability from our system, but it was hard to make sure that we weren't removing min-maxing when we were removing math as much as we could. Um, so the min-maxing in here really comes into the semantics of your abilities and exactly how they're worded, because a lot of the uh, checks... Uh, every single check really is up to interpretation. Um, you roll, you, the GM is going to ask you for a check 
and then the player is going to look at their character sheet and determine which of their abilities or hindrances is going to apply to this check. Uh, it's not necessarily make a perception check. You have a stat for that. It is just make a check to try to find this empty bag hidden somewhere in this room. Um, you're not going to have uh, make me a check to find an empty bag as a specific stat on a character sheet. It is just if you have um, good eyes, uh, yeah, you can use that to help you find the bag. If you have a good nose, then yeah, that would also assist. Um, if you, uh, if there's multiple people looking, then that you can use the help action, spend some effort. Someone with a good nose gets to roll multiple dice. Um, so that was, uh, it was, it was difficult to keep, uh, min maxing in, but it, it still definitely does work, especially with, uh, we find it works best with like a grapple mechanic. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are certain abilities that like do extra damage when you are grabbing someone. Uh, there are many different abilities to allow you to grab someone in the first place. Um, and they say grab. They don't say grabbing what you're grabbing them with. So I believe we removed it for now, but I think it's going to go in pretty soon here. But there was a uh, Conjure Vine ability. And what the player in Alpha did was they took Grappler but applied it to their vine as well as themselves because they're using a vine to grab someone. So technically, they get the bonus of grappler. And uh, my uh, my own sort of uh, way to make that correct uh, was saying that the grappler ability isn't necessarily about you know you're strong and good at grappling it's more about the knowledge of wrestling moves and which joints to put pressure on and you can do that with a vine as well as you can do it with your own limbs mm -hmm. so there are definitely ways to stack different abilities on top of each other to if you want min max your character it's just a different kind yeah i can cer i can certainly get that and I do. Rem I do remember one of the, one of the things that that I had in the back of my mind because I'm always thinking about um, the not just not just the game in front of me, but but the future proofing of it. Um, putting aside the scaling part, where do you draw the line between traits and talents? Um. So, I originally was drawing inspiration from Dungeons and Dragons again where you know you've got your class abilities and you've got your racial abilities mm -hmm. or uh species abilities where whatever your uh addition you're playing um so traits are more like racial abilities where they are static they do not change they are just pieces of who you are typically they will be um uh, like how you're made or what you have inherited from your parents um, or what kind of uh, species you're playing. So you can have wings, you can have um, metallic, you can have uh, good eyesight, you can have bad eyesight. Well, no, that's the struggle. Um, but you can have like different senses that are improved because of these traits that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas talents are more like class abilities, and those are going to be learned and learned and improved upon as you continue playing the game. Yeah. Now, one of the, I do remember one of the things I, I um, observed when it came to traits. Actually, not not traits. Um, talents is mm -hmm. how is is how it handles ranks. Like you have you have some that you have some that are that have set that have seven ranks there are some that have um four, there are some that have four um what was what was there was there a bit of a guideline that you that you had internally in terms of how many ranks a given talent should have honestly we didn't really have a guideline when we were writing those um 
like you can only get so good at something before you've maxed out the ability. There's no way you can get any better at it. Um, especially mechanically with a D6 being the best die you can roll. Yeah. Um, whereas with uh, certain other talents, there are different things that you can layer on top of it, um, apply this ability to more situations. And so those have much more filled out rank uh, system, many more ranks filled out and fewer dead ones in the middle, and they go up much, much higher. Um, mm -hmm. Like, f it, the other reason that we don't have, you know, all the way up to rank 10 for every single talent is, you know, if you're investigating, you know, you should be, it's okay to be able to max this out at, you know, level three or so. Um, because as you level up, you're going to also, if you choose to, get more effort, which will allow you to add more dice and increase your uh, your chances of getting a good roll instead of getting lower and lower dice. Because we wanted to be able to give, you know, we only have two dice to um, size down and improve your roll in that way. Mm -hmm. um, the only other way is to add dice on top of it. And even when you're adding if, dice, you're still you're still having it add die and then pick the lowest. Right, exactly. So though, with those being the two mechanics, when you get higher and higher level, you have to rely more on more on effort to spend and roll more dice instead of uh, relying on your static passive abilities to uh, roll lower dice. Mm -hmm. Now. I will I will admit that there that um I did notice some talent some talents had what could be considered dead ranks. Yes. And I am I am curious if that's something that you guys are going to be going to be looking into going forward. Uh we definitely did. Uh for those that saw the last uh published playtest version, there were a lot more dead ranks. Uh, one of the biggest pieces of feedback is the one you're giving right now of like, I'd like to see those dead ranks filled out so it feels like I'm getting something when I spend my level up points there, you know? Um, and that is something we're still working on for sure. The, we are going to try to fill out as many dead ranks as we can, but there are still definitely going to be some that will remain, especially with uh, weapon training. Being able to on all of your attacks, use a lower die is a huge boon um, because it is so applicable to every single situation. So for the weapon training uh, talents and things like that, there are, are going to be those dead ranks where you're going to have to spend, spend your rank points on your level up uh, and not get anything in return because once you hit that, you know, third rank and you start getting to roll that D8 for every single attack roll, huge, huge bonus. Um, because uh, for one reason, there aren't any monsters with a uh, defense that is higher than eight. So that is the first time where you can say it, there, there are, you're fighting a monster with a defense of eight. Uh, and you're rolling a D8, and a tie goes to the player. So if you roll a D8 on the attack, and the defense is 8, and that's the goal, there's no way for you to possibly miss. And then that is the first time where uh, that at le you get this ability at level 3 if you spend your ranks properly. We didn't want to open that up at level 1. Uh, that just felt too powerful. We needed to spread out the abilities and the power scaling along this leveling system as best we could. Mm -hmm. So, with the, and that brings me to the um, the powers system, which is which having having it be a sister to talents is is certainly the the smart move, um, but. Was this initial was this initially supposed to be your magic system that just um, accidented its way into being a power system? Um, yeah, 
essentially. That's how it started for sure, uh, because all of the games I had played were fantasy. So that's what I knew best, and that's where I started with designing. Uh, so you're going to see uh, maybe some... Uh, we've tried to get rid of as much of the magical lingo inside those powers as we could, but it's still there. The vibe is def definitely still magical. Um, but where there are other suggestions in there, like for control fire, that power, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, you summon fire from your fingertips with no, uh, no assistance. It could be you're a robot and you have a flamethrower built into your arm. That is... Uh, that is would also fall under uh, control fire. It's all in how you flavor what your powers are. Um, we just had we just had the starting with a magic system as the basis, and then expanding that, um, making all of the uh, vernacular more vague, so it could apply to sci-fi and horror and all the other. Um, supernatural type of uh, genres that people might want to play. Yeah, and that that certainly makes sense. And I'd as far as as far as getting out of the magic thing, that's always going to be there, much in the same way as you can train to catch a ball with your opposite hand, but you're, but um, a left-handed you person be is quite not as good as it. <laughs> a yeah. left-handed person is not is not going to be an be an unlefty <laughs> exactly and i can he i can hear my colleague laughing in the distance because he's ambidextrous <laughs> but the of course, admittedly so admittedly some of the um some of some of the some of the some of the powers that are there definitely lend themselves to to that to that spell approach, I am curious if in the full game you plan on putting a something of a something of a style guide for make for players or GMs who want to make their own talents and or um, powers. Um. Yeah. In the final edition, we are going to be expanding upon heavily expanding upon. Um, emphasis on reflavoring what is in the book to fit your setting or genre. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a necessary step that we as game designers cannot do for you. That is something that is up to the game master and the players to do. Yeah. Um, so that is, yeah, we are going to be putting more of that how to flavor your stuff inside the final iteration. Yeah, the now ref reflavoring can reflavoring is nice, but the the big reason why I br why I brought up the why I brought why I brought why I brought up a style guide is because no matter how no matter how much we ch no matter how much we as designers um try and reflavor, that's only going to go so far. Mm-hmm. And the the this is this is the reason why that why that sort of thing is necessary. I remember. Um, so sorry to get on a bit of a tangent, but just just to help for just to help further this particular thing. Um, yeah, I have heard I have heard for many years about about how how um how you can use D and D to run any kind of fantasy. Well. <sighs> As you as you've probably learned and and as I've known for years, um, the further out from Europe you get, the har the harder it is to justify that claim. <laughs> <laughs> and the conundrum that I often bring up is: consider what is the most common way to equip a f to equip a fighter in D and D? Uh, sword and shield. Yes. Usually, lo usually long sword, or in some, or in some builds, bastard sword, and large shield. Now, how are you going to do that in a culture where shields aren't really a thing, at least not in the man portable sense? Is something which, if you're doing, in, if you're doing something that's a little bit more Japan themed, 
That's a question you might have to answer. Oh. Not only not only that, but the concept of the of the spellcaster who's locked up in his tower studying dusty tomes. That's not real that's not really a universal thing. <laughs> that right. is far, that is far more of a that's far more of a of a European thing. And even and even then I'm ki I'm kind of I'm kind of stretching things. Oh. Yeah. Like even you... like with uh dragons, you've got your western dragon and your eastern dragon. They are very different. Mhm. Mm and I like in the this is this is the reason why it why it is import, important to consider um not not necessarily hard and fast rules on how to make talents but a guideline of do's and don'ts. I've I've said I've said a similar thing when it comes to the aspect system in fate and that's what that's why fate um frustrates me but that's another story. We do we do have our you know um, how to make your own uh, make sure that you follow these guidelines, but we don't have any um, any style suggestions in there. Um, we don't want to tell uh, the players how to flavor their game or how to what their vibe should be. Um, I think putting like a uh, uh, maybe a separate section in of uh, saying these are the uh, there is a lot of different ways of telling these stories out there. There are a lot of different uh, cultures other than the one than the one that you were raised in. Um, this is what they are like uh, and then go on from there. But the drawback to that just from like a publishing standpoint, is we would need to hire many uh, sensitivity consultants to make sure that all of that is going to be accurate and none of it is going to rub anyone the wrong way. Um, it, it becomes dangerous territory when you are starting to write about cultures that are not your own. Um, so it is. it has been something that is on our minds. Um, we aren't sure at this point whether we're going to be putting something like that in there. I personally would like to. Um, there's just a lot of different uh, logistical and social, not socioeconomical, but cultural pitfalls that we would have to avoid in putting something like that into a publication. Now, main event time. Because <laughs> the, the next thing I wanted to ask is on, is on the equipment thing. Because... You'll recall in the unimpressions video I did that was that was one of my big sticking points, is yes. the fact that now I I do want to make clear the idea of having common uncommon and ex and exotic equipment that that I don't have a problem with the issue the issue is treating or er, treating modern Earth as the baseline for the, for that for that. Except that I find that that would only work if you if you have a default setting, and given the fact that you're that part of the saga's acronym is setting and genre is setting and genre agnostic right. system, that's not exactly something that that can that can be done that can be done. Um, right. Because because um now just just to use the example that I used at the time was um. Star Wars, where some where um, blasters are go blasters are going to be common. Everybody's going to have one, but something, but um, a firearm that f that fires physical ammunition, i.e., a slug thrower, is going to be less so, e either because people see them as antiques or be or because they are very sp because that kind of thing would be significantly more specialized. Mm hmm. Oh. And it's the, and that's that's just with one, that's just with one setting. And I'm, and I know that you I know that you had you had mentioned in the comment to that video that you are that you are planning on addressing that. Um, what can you tell me about the 
the approach that you guys are ta you guys are taking with it? Is it just um, readjusting what what um, the baseline for common is? No, um, we are actually right now we're still toying around with it. But um, for example, in a recent playtest, uh, which you can go watch on Wally DM's channel, um, we were doing a western. And in our character building for that, we determined, yeah, guns should be common. Pretty much everyone in a Western setting is going to know how to use a gun. Um, but right now, they are listed as, in the, in the document, it is listed as an uncommon weapon. Um, and we decided while we were building a character to change that to common. Uh, and that is following the, you know, that, that was all following the instructions. There's a little blurb in there of like, you can change the rarity of a weapon to fit your setting better. Um, I'm actually right now, we are considering just doing away with labeling and having, um, set rarities for each piece of equipment. Um, there will be some notable exceptions like, uh, like for explosives, uh, you're going to have your common explosive, your uncommon explosive and your exotic explosive where they they can scale from a typical hand grenade or firecracker all the way up to a timed poison release into a city's water supply. Um, so with some exceptions, we, I think we're going to be removing that entirely and just having to leave it up to the GM to determine what the rarity of a weapon is and the what definite what defines what its rarity is is how long it takes for a person in this world to learn how to use it effectively so a common weapon is something that you can just pick up and use easily so most people are going to be able to pick up a sword and swing it and deal a good amount of damage to whatever they're swinging at uh, same thing with like a hammer or an axe. Um, whereas not everyone is going to know where the safety is on every gun that they pick up. Um, not And there are some exotic ones. Like I, I think it would take quite a bit of training to be able to use a whip and uh, hit a specific point with any sort of reliability. So mm -hmm. that is the difference in common, uncommon, exotic. Common is something that you can just pick up and use. Uncommon is something that would take you like an hour or two to figure out at most. So uh, most guns, like you can probably pick it up, make sure you know where all the buttons are, and you can pull the trigger and do damage and learn how to aim correctly. Um and exotic weapons are going to take much longer than that. Days, weeks, months of training at least in order mm. to be able to use effectively. So our answer is I don't like it right now, to be honest, of just like getting rid of the baseline that we have in for every single piece, uh, every single weapon in there because I want to provide some sort of guideline beyond, you know, just make it up yourself. Your setting, you get to pick. Um I want to put something more in there and we're still working through what exactly that's going to look like. If if I can if I can offer my own suggestion in, instead yeah, of doing the instead of doing the pick what you want um I'd advi I'd advise but I'd advise putting it at, po positing it as a question to the GM of what of um what it what is what is re what would be readily available? What would require some training in the in their particular setting? This isn't a obviously this isn't a question that's meant to have an answer, but it's meant to be one of those as my t as my mentor would put thought would put it thought for the day. Maybe worth thinking about, may not be worth thinking about, may have an answer, may not have an answer. Designed only to make you think. Mm hmm. But it, it definitely could have something useful come from it for sure. Mm hmm. But the now get now going on going on fr going on from that. Um, I know I, I know I had mentioned reg I know I had mentioned regarding um, regarding guidelines for ta for talents, and I'm 
I'd ha I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if the, if you guys have a similar style guide in mind for um for creating equipment because in yes. to use an to use an example in say a if someone was doing a a more um military adjacent kind of campaign or e even one where they're just playing as mer just playing as mercenaries um mm -hmm. there's a, people are people are used to the idea of fi of finding attachments and way and ways to customize um firearms um even more so, even more so depending on the game like you like all of the attachments and mods you're going to see in something like Shadowrun or Cyberpunk um, right and i'm cu i'm curious if if the if those sorts of customizations are are something you guys have um, put into consideration for the full for if not if not the full book then at least down the road that that's exactly what we were thinking um something like that would be a pretty complex add to add, to put into this uh srd this first you know handbook of how this game works mm -hmm. um if if we do uh run into uh and have enough requests of like, I want to see what it would look like if you could attach barbed wire to a baseball bat and what would the mechanics for that look like? Or what would it look like if I put a different stock on this uh, firearm that I have? Um, that would that would have to be part of a uh, supplement on a different release. But it is something we have thought about. We just have decided that it's not going to be a part of the uh, basic rules. Mm-hmm. And that that's that's definitely one that's definitely one approach. And I I will admit I do appreciate the fact that there's one particular trap that often happened that happened a lot in universalist games, especially in the two thousands, and to a lesser extent nowadays, that is not present here. And this is something I did talk about. It is the notion of um, characters and NPCs being made using the same rule set. Mm -hmm. Whereas... um, essentially, they are the same uh, mm -hmm. in sagas. Um, there, but it is not. Uh, there's a bigger difference that allows them to be much easier to run. Uh, this is another thing I've taken from Dungeons and Dragons, where monster stat blocks as a DM much easier to run than a whole character sheet. Um, and they're designed to be that way. So NPCs and PCs in sagas, the pretty much the only difference in them is, um, is that NPCs cannot use effort. To be frank, that's a huge difference and a wild uh, detriment because that means that you cannot uh, add on to the roles that you're making. You cannot add extra dice to your own stuff or anyone else's. Um, we're still working on exactly what that's going to look like, to be honest, because that also means that many of the talents and powers are going to be off limits for NPCs, and that's not what we want. So it's another thing that we're uh, still workshopping is how NPCs look like in comparison to monsters and player characters. Mm-hmm. And in re and in in regard to in regard to that, um, I'm gu I'm guessing that in the f that in the full book you will ha you will have a m a more expanded um bestiary. I mean there there's already oh, yes. there's already a hand Absolutely. there's already a handful a as is, but um. One can one can never have enough, and I do, I do appreciate that you that you didn't carry over um, challenge rating. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that's been probably the hardest thing to figure out. I know Dungeons and Dragons does not do a good job, so I've been uh, working with my math whiz cousin to try to figure out how to balance encounters, and it's been, to put it lightly, difficult. <laughs> yeah, that ca that kind of thing always is. Um, challenge rating has been my whipping boy since 2000, largely because largely because of the fact that it's that is built on assumptions, and 
I'm, pr I'm pretty sure you're assuming sure you're... that there's no surprise round. We're also assuming that there's about an equal number of monsters as there are party members. We're also assuming, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Well, you know what they say about assuming, right? <laughs> Ass of you and me. Mm-hmm. And even even ba even back in 2000, the big problem they had initially was that assuming a balanced party of four. Yeah. When there's so many, uh, when there's so many how options, I, play. I don't know about you. Even if it was how I play, you should you shouldn't be assuming that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Whether or not that's how I play is 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 irrelevant. Have Have you ever heard of um of ha of Hanlon's? Have you ever heard of Hanlon's Razor? I know Occam's Razor. I might I might be confu I might be confusing the two. Let me let me. Occam's Razor, the simplest solution yeah. is probably the right one. Yeah, that's that's the one I'm thinking of. Hanlon's Razor is okay, the whole okay. never assume malice when stupidity will do. <laughs> but, gotcha. <laughs> but that's that's the simplified version of it, but it's basically that a hypothesis should not ha should have as few assumptions as possible. Right. Um or it, the way the way it was written as it, I'm not going to butcher the original Latin, but it tra it translates as entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. It make the do as much as you can with as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And the thing and the thing that the this is this is why there's this is why there's that issue and why uh, and the thing that I find especially funny about this, about the whole CR, is um, fourth edition didn't use it. <laughs> it really? It fourth edition, instead of doing that, doubled down on a roll system, where there where there were diff Instead of having one stat block for for one given monster, you had you had um. You had monster entries that had their own that had their own little subtypes, and within that there were there were specific um, there were specific roles within it. Um, the you, this is this is where you this is where you get things like um, like skir like skirm like skirmishers like assaulters solos were were the equivalent of bosses because they were meant to be. Um, so be something that was powerful enough to take on the whole party, um, all right. by all by themselves. Um, the the ro uh, now I have it. the roles that they had were um, artillery, brute, controller, lurker, skirmisher, and soldier. Um, some of them might have the leader in um in a, as a sub as a um, subtype and. Obviously, artillery is artillery is meant to be peppering you from range. Brute is meant to be getting up close. Controllers are meant to be either doing AOE or deep or um buffs and, or debuffs. Um, lurkers are your lurkers are your sneaky boys. Skirmishers are your hit and runners, and soldiers are your um are your rank and files. And yep. there were different XP rewards, but there but they weren't doing the and there were levels for each of the um each of the mo each of the monsters but it wasn't a case of um of of assuming a C uh, assuming a CR right which is one of those cases where I, f I find it which is why I found it amusing when for 5th edition they brought that back because that uh, that there issue are some uh, things in 4th edition that worked very well um, uh, getting rid of CR was a good idea. <laughs> I remember, I remember Audible cheering when the, when it was announced that Fourth Edition wasn't going to be using the Vancean model. Um, and I know, I know some people like to do like to do the whole oh it's oh it's just, it's a board it's a board game. There's no role playing involved. Um, <sighs> I liken I liken that kind of thing to how. Eight to how there was a bit of a Mandela effect regarding characters like Batman, where after the Joel Schumacher movies stank up the place, people 
had this idea, started having this hallucination in their heads where Batman was al- was always grim dark until Joel Schumacher came along and mucked it up. You know, as as if everyone just forgot the drug trip that was the Silver Age. My personal one of my favorite Batman things ever is the Adam West Batman. Freaking hilarious. Well, it's it's that series that helped put the character on the map. Uh-huh. Oh. And pay, and paying ch- I remember I remember one of the big complaints about Schumacher was him was him doing more at was him doing more an, of an Adam West approach, which I don't think that's what he was trying to do. I think he was trying to to do a nod to Dick Sprang, who what who was who was writing Batman around the time of the Adam West show. Remember the the Silver Age was weird, <laughs> but. You had you had you had these you a bit you basically had a can't have your cake and eat it too because the Warners wanted something more t- more child friendly but also wanted it to be as dark as the first film. If that that's... sounds stupid, that's because it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the point is a, a lot of a lot of people had this idea of 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 that it was that it was always this always this grim always this grim dark detective thing and and the, and only only um Schumacher came along and and mucked it up when that was ne- when that was never the case um in the same vein you had I, I remember seeing people saying um third edition was perfect and then fourth edition came along and mucked it up i was there for some of the comp- for the response to third edition and it's very hilarious seeing seeing people do these long rants back in 2000 about how it was turning D&D into Diablo. Ironic because there was an AD&D Diablo <laughs> module that came out a few years before then. <laughs> of course there was. <laughs> I mean I'm, I'm not I'm not knocking that if you're if you're going to if you're going to steal steal from the best. So steal mm-hmm. f- so you may as well steal from Diablo which is close to the best. <laughs> but the, but it's one it's one of the it's one of those things that people collectively forget and i i have been laughing hysterically seeing so many designers look look back at look back at um fourth edition and go and going maybe maybe we may going maybe we were too hard on this and i'm sitting here going oh now oh now you decide to see reason <laughs> where where the hell where the I, hell I were you in take a lot of uh, a lot of stuff from fourth edition well not a lot specifically the minion system brilliant mm-hmm. um matt colville did a video on it a while ago that inspired me to start looking for uh good ideas on how to change how i run my game inside other editions um, yeah and that is the one that is stuck and is the most popular i think mm-hmm. and now, with with that in, with that in mind, um, one thing that I did appreciate with the and I'm I'm guessing you'll be expanding this in the full book, in the in the back end of the um, of the of the version of sagas that's currently available, you have three pregens, but you did something with pregens that I don't see done all that often, and I I think I called this out. And that is yes. giving a um, giving a guide beyond just first level because so many games when they do pre when they do pre gens or example characters, they will do just them starting out. Maybe if you get lucky, you'll get a more advanced version. I know I know um, um, Savage Worlds has basic and advanced versions of their pre gens at times, but that is a rarity. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you a secret. Um, (laughs) The reason I built all those uh, pregens out to include a full level up tree and guide for what they take at what levels in their progression is because (laughs) I use them all the time as NPCs or player characters when I just don't have the extra 10 minutes to create one. Um, and I need it to be a specific level, and I don't feel like 
leveling it up to the level I need it to be at. So that is what those tables are there for initially. Um, a lot. I've heard the same feedback that you're giving is uh, people love seeing like what an actual level of progression would look like. It's super helpful. Um, and I'm like, great, I'll leave it in there. Really, they were just for me to make sure that the NPC I needed in that moment could be the correct level. Um, so that's that's the story behind why those exist. Um, but I'm glad that they are getting the attention um, that they are right now, for sure. Mm -hmm. And I do look for I do look forward to seeing how it how it develops and progresses. Uh, now, speaking of that, I I know that you I know that you're going to be hitting um kick going to be hitting Kickstarter soon. Um, when do you when do you plan on launching th launching that end? Uh, with the current plan, uh, the Kickstarter will go live at the beginning of 2024 in January. Mm -mm. So you can, so you can, you can, you can throw that in and add, and add in, fuck you, it's January. <laughs> it is almost poetic that the Kickstarter goes live in January, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, which... Well, it's the it's the perfect time to to do this sort of thing because it's going to be cold as hell and everybody's going to be inside. <laughs> it is the marking the one year anniversary of the OGL debacle mm -hmm. that originally inspired its creation. And who who knows? By that time, maybe Watsy will put will put out that virtual tabletop so I can laugh at that too. Because. <laughs> <laughs> Ser seriously, bi seriously, building a virtual tabletop on on, on Unreal. What the hell were you thinking? We'll see what it, what happens with it. I um, it's been a while since I paid actual attention to uh, what Watsi is doing. Like, I think they came out with like a Giants book recently or something. No idea what's in it. Um, uh, I have not looked at any of the uh, updated system stuff either. Uh, since I look, the first one came out, I looked at one, and I was so disgusted. I I and I ended up, I ended up cutting it off there. And that was the that was one of the playtest documents for the warlock, and it was a masterclass in missing the point. Mm. Because, and that actually, actually, I I remember when I I remember the first response was me quoting Godfather, going, "Look how they massacred my boy." Because <laughs> they dis for they decided to make warlocks half casters and get get rid of the auto scaling um, spell effect that they had, which was actually a, which everybody liked. As well, uh, they also got rid of the fact that they no longer get their spells back on a short rest. The argument that they had was that was that they would have more opportunity to use spells. The problem is they're a half cast. They're a half caster without anything to balance that out. Cuz ev even Eldric Blast and 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 the like were get were getting the bat. So it's like you took you took away what you took away what made them special and just made them another just made them another um half caster. And if somebody really wants to do that, there are be there are better opportun there are better um, options. Oh. I have not. I'm not going to defend Watsi's decision. Not my job. I will get uh, nothing but flack for doing so at this point, too. Oh, of course. Of course, the real laugh came when I when I looked at um, Tales of the Valley, and I'm like, see, this is how you do things. <laughs> But that's a, that's a story for another for another day. Um, what do you sh for sagas as far as its full book? What are you shooting for as far as the page count goes? Um, we expect it to be still under forty pages, and we are going to keep our promise of making sure that the basic rules uh, for the entire thing stay under ten. Mm -hmm. I can I can get that. But with with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. 
It has been truly enjoyable. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>